I looked at the past 10 years of analyst forecasts for the S&P 500 from 10 of the biggest investment banks to see how good the professionals are at predicting what will happen to the stock market in There's one year's time. And the results are shocking. In this video, I'm going to show you how they did, who was the best forecaster and how accurate were they, and how bad was the worst forecaster. You'll also learn the answer to why stock market predictions for the upcoming year are released in the first place. And most importantly, what does all of this mean for your investment decisions? Hey everyone, my name is Preet and I'm a consultant to the wealth management industry and a former stockbroker. And this channel is for anyone who wants to be more empowered with making prudent decisions with their money without all the sensationalism. Every year, like clockwork, investment strategists at all the big firms release their price targets for the S&P 500, one of the main barometers of the US stock market, and one of the most watched stock market indexes in the world. The predictions for 2024 have just been collected from a number of firms, and their forecasts for the end of 2024 for the S&P 500 range from 4,200 to 5,400 points. The baseline forecast is modest upside. Just say that again, slowly. So a, a retest of the lows for 3,500. We're at 4,500. Yes, 20% yes, down from current levels. Oh my God. Foresee the market hitting um, all time high, or new all time highs by June of next year. Based on where the S&P 500 was midday on Monday, December 11th of this year, that means that JP Morgan is the most bearish with a prediction of a 9.5% loss for 2024. And Yardeni Research is the most bullish with a call for a 14.8% gain. The average forecast for the 16 strategists in this list was a gain of 6.2% from current levels. So these predictions are all over the place. What are you supposed to do with that information? And here's kind of a fascinating question. The compensation for the people who put their names to these forecasts likely range from at least a few hundred thousand dollars per year on the low end to millions per year. No doubt they are all smart people if they are working for these firms. So then how can they have such wildly different predictions every year? And I know what you're thinking, perhaps it's a meritocracy over time, right? The highest paid strategists are the ones with the best long-term track record. Well, one of the first things you might think to do is see which firm has the best track record for their predictions. And that might help you figure out which forecast you might put the most stock into, no pun intended. Well, that's what I did. I looked at 10 years worth of S&P 500 and one year predictions from 10 of the top firms. And I gathered their one-year forecast starting from 2013, which would have been a prediction for the 2014 calendar year, and then calculated the implied percentage return for the calendar year, given the end-of-year closing price level of the S&P 500. I then compared the implied returns to the actual return for the S&P 500 for that year, and then did the same for a total of 10 years. Now, 2023 is, of course, not over at the time I'm recording this, so the actual return for 2023 is only up until December 8th. And I suppose a lot can happen in the last three weeks of the year, but I included the info in the table so you can see how things are looking for this year's predictions, too. Now, for the 10 different firms over the last 10 years, there was only one forecast I could not find. Societe Generale's forecast for 2022. Everyone just calls them SOCGEN. But after searching for just that one forecast for about eight hours, I gave up. And ironically, their office is literally next door to where I live. And I do mean literally. Perhaps ironically, SOCGEN fared the worst of the 10 firms. The average amount that their forecasts deviated from the actual return of the S&P 500 was 15.9 percentage points. One other thing to note was that their forecasts were almost always way too low, with only one exception. They did make one perfect call in 2015. They essentially called for a flat market with a year-end level of 2,050 points, and the market actually ended up at 2,043.9 points, which by all accounts would be a perfect forecast. But every other year, they underguessed the market by a very wide margin. Their second best call was off by 9.2 percentage points. Okay, well, who ranked the best over the last 10 years? JP Morgan, with a very big caveat. They had one forecast within one percentage point in 2014 and one other forecast within two percentage points in 2016. And the rest of their forecasts were pretty evenly split between guessing too high and guessing too low. And if you just 
average the differences in forecast returns and actual returns of the market, they ended up with an impressive looking 0.4 percentage point average difference. But here's the problem. You can't just average the differences. You have to average the absolute magnitude of the differences. If you're under by 10% one year and then over by 10% the next year, no one would call you a forecasting genius. And when you again look at the average amount their forecasts deviated from the actual market performance, we get 10.5 percentage points. That's the average that they were wrong by. Let's just think about this for a second. The most accurate firm when making one-year forecasts for the S&P 500 over the last 10 years was off by an average of 10.5 percentage points. All right, now here are the rest of the rankings from best to worst for the 10 firms that I looked at. And perhaps that should be labeled least worst to worst because I think it's generally clear that looking at one-year forecasts from people who are paid handsomely to do just that is of very little utility for average investors. And I'm willing to bet that if you asked anyone who puts out these forecasts what their value is, they would probably agree. I mean, they can analyze numbers better than I can, and these results are horrible no matter how you slice it. In fact, one management consultant notes that it's like being professionally obliged to make a fool of yourself. And according to Joaquin Clement in a piece written for the CFA Institute, return forecasts over timeframes like one year or less are extremely unreliable. In fact, anyone who uses these forecasts for investment decisions should seriously reconsider their investment process. So here's the money question. Why are market forecasts a thing? Well, first off, we should recognize that these forecasts all come from the sell side of the street. So they are in the business of sales and selling their ideas and their advisory, their smarts, and putting out tidbits of research into the market helps get eyeballs for the services that they are selling. But here's where it gets really interesting. If you wanna stand out from the crowd, you need to stand out from the crowd. And that can generally be done in two ways. Make a big bold call, like calling for a big gain or a big loss, or you can have a compelling yet simplistic thesis. Not because they're dumb, but because they are smart and they know that the audience is more likely to be attracted to something that they can more easily understand. These big, simple idea approaches would generally hinge around one central point for the entire thesis, or the, at least the way that they sell it, like inflation is the key, or it's all about the federal funds rate, or employment, or whatever. It's all part of the sales goals of these firms. And there's a great article from The New Yorker that I'll link to in the description that explains why expert forecasters that appear in the media don't tend to fare better than non-experts at predicting the very same events, and even worse, are rarely held accountable for their bad calls. When it comes to getting predictions wrong, there are generally three tactics used to dissuade you from the notion that they can't predict short-term markets. Number one, they got the timing wrong. They're just early, you wait and see. Uh, they can use this one for years, by the way, and often do. Number two, an unexpected event occurred that no reasonable person could have foreseen. Uh, the problem with that is that this happens every year. And number three, they were wrong, but for the right reasons, which always makes me think of a very famous saying that the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So there's little downside for getting it wrong, but the upside for nailing a call is that you can dine out on it forever. Look no further than the Michael Burries of the world or any perma bear who is always calling for a downturn. And, you know, as they say, even a stopped watch is right twice a day. And hopefully it goes without saying that the people who forecast the price of Bitcoin in the next year are also worth ignoring as well. But there's an asymmetrical risk profile to making one-year market calls. Get it wrong, no one cares. Nail an outlier call once in a while and you're famous. Hence, the incentives are to keep on doing it even though it provides no reliable value to investors. To quote the article in The New Yorker, our system of expertise is completely inside out. It rewards bad judgments over good ones. That's pretty damning. So what does this all mean to you as an investor? Hopefully it should be very clear by now that the short-term market predictions from the supposed best of the best 
are useless to you. This speaks to the difficulty in making short-term predictions about investments and why your focus is much better off on the very long term. A much more prudent approach, assuming a well-diversified portfolio that is matched to your risk profile, is to ignore the short term as we know it is unpredictable, but we know that short-term volatility has rewarded investors with higher returns over the long term. The more we appreciate that the price for higher return potential is accepting short-term unpredictability and volatility, the easier it is to ignore these forecasts, although not impossible. It really does help the channel out if you hit the like button, and please do subscribe for more content like this, and I will see here. you in the next video. What it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware Think it's time we stop, children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down